G'day guys, today we're going to talk about the Anglo-Saxon burr. Goodness me, what a strange word, burr. It's spelt in a whole bunch of different ways. B-U-R, B-U-R-R, B-U-R-G-H, B-U-R-G, B-U-R-Y, and probably about six other ways that I can't think of right now. Okay, so what was this thing, when was it invented, and who invented them? Let's take a look. The main source of information for this is the Birdle Heidage. I'm going to leave a link in the description below. There's also a whole bunch of other links uh, that I'll be providing. Please check the above link. That's going to be our resource guide to uh, all of my Anglo-Saxon library. So a burr was basically a fortified settlement or town vastly different in concept to the, the Norman Motten Bailey. The Norman Motten Bailey was principally a fortified residence. It was also a military stronghold and also a place of um, local governance. But very, very different. The Motten Bailey is a relatively small structure, but it has a very key difference being that it's designed to impose a kind of um, intimidation on the local population. From here the soldiers rush out and they can quash rebellions. Uh, the people inside are very much people to be afraid of. Uh, they are the ones who uh, assert dominance over the local population. Uh, it's, it's not about providing protection for the local population really at all. Certainly not in the early stages of the Norman conquest. The Anglo-Saxon burr was an entirely different proposition. The Anglo-Saxon burr, whilst yes the military would move out of this, it would also be about providing protection for refugees. It was actually designed specifically for refugees. In theory, no Anglo-Saxon population should have been more than 20 miles away from one of these. So towns, villages, farms and so on would have all been fairly close by and therefore should a threat arise the villagers could go back into the burr, seek medium term protection, that is uh, there would be areas specifically designed for refugees to be able to stay uh, whilst uh, there would be caches of supplies for a military uh, to be able to maintain itself in the field. The burr was essentially designed as a response to the 9th century Viking incursions, Scandinavian Viking incursions that were occurring throughout England and obviously there were major deficiencies in the, the military network at the time of Anglo-Saxon England. Those deficiencies are fairly easy to, to really understand. May, of most importance Anglo-Saxon England up to this point was really designed around um, localised conflicts, internal conflicts, and conflicts between Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and it really didn't have the uh, understanding of external conflict, that is raiders coming in from overseas. It really hadn't happened much in the last couple of hundred years. You had seen raids coming down from the Picts, you had seen raids coming from the Scoots, that is the Scotland. There were also raids coming in from Ireland and there was raids going out to Ireland from places like Mercia and so on. However, for the most part, these were few and far between. Anglo-Saxon society just really wasn't built around um, being able to endure frequent attacks from different, keyword there being different, uh, Scandinavian tribes. So one tribe might attack one week and another tribe might attack another week. It was very much like that. So once you had this kind of raiding concept, because that's really what the earlier phase of the Viking raids were about, relatively small war bands of 30 to 50 raiders going into villages 
um, taking hostages, taking people kidnapped, stealing treasures, stealing whatever they could really, food, livestock, and slaughtering, um, causing fear and disruption. So how do you respond to that when you don't have anything really in place to, to, to do that through? Well, this video specifically wants to look at the burr itself and, and how that worked and what it was. So not only was it a religious center, and the religious center had a very key and integral role with this because the religious buildings at the time were often three, four stories tall, and therefore they could provide a really good lookout base uh, to see the surrounding countryside. Remember, at the time, England was not built on multi-story buildings. England was really about single-story structures, sometimes two-story. So a third story would give you so much more view over the local expanse. And you could see ships coming up rivers or onto beaches and you would be able to deploy resources accordingly. The key thing, the key change that Alfred the Great brought about during his reign was he created a network of roads and he rehabilitated many of the Roman roads that interconnected the various burrs that he built. And he also built this connection of around about 33 burrs in his lifetime. Further burrs were built during uh, the reign of his children and the reign of his grandchildren. And you ended up with, uh, we think, around about 120 or so burrs throughout England, uh, which provided incredible resistance to uh, future Scandinavian Viking raids. Some of these burrs were entirely new. So it was basically a, a town or a village had, had developed because of its location. So often these towns and villages would develop out of marketplaces. And if you had a good location, which might be a, uh, an intersection between a river and a major road structure, then it would be a logical place to start a trading post. And from that trading post might develop a small village. And therefore, um, it was obvious that many of these new burrs would have to be constructed. Alfred also looked um, at many of the other defensive positions that had been built by the Romans and the Celts and the native Britons, and he rehabilitated these structures. So what that means is he rebuilt earthworks and he put up what's called a palisade or basically a wooden fence structure. These were typically around three or three and a half meters tall. They would often have a wall walk, towers, a major gate, structures and so on. So you could very easily control who was coming in and out of the, of the burr itself. The birds were very well designed. So not only do you have a place for the refugees to come and seek shelter, you'd have a place for the local fjord, that is the local militia, to be able to cache weapons, um, ammunition essentially, that being arrows, armor, shields, to, a place to be able to maintain all of this equipment, a place to be able to maintain foods and stores, and the ability to transport that equipment. So we're looking at um, not only to be able to keep, maintain a supply of horses, to maintain uh, horse food, to maintain food for humans, and also the carts and the wagons required to move all this stuff. It's very easy to, to lose the sight of this because it's not portrayed at all in really in movies and, and in the TV shows, but an army requires a massive logistical supply chain. And this is really one of the key reasons why the invasion of Normandy struggled because these supply lines have become so, so massively stretched, but that's a whole different story and, and not something that I'm going to be covering. Okay, so back to, um, back to the Anglo-Saxons. Okay, so we actually really don't know a whole lot about how this, um, the logistical support was provided for uh, the fjords and the, the armies of the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, we don't know whether it had its own integral medical support. Um, we know that the Romans did, and the Romans really invented that. So that would be a logical kind of conclusion to draw, but there's no evidence for that. So it's not something that we can really state. We don't know, um, I guess, 
how the logistics really were formed, were there, were there caches in other villages to supply this kind of thing? Because when you think, especially in the later Anglo-Saxon period, when you're talking about armies of five, six, and 8,000 soldiers, that is a massive amount of food to consume. It's also a massive amount of food for the horses. You'd need dozens and dozens and dozens of blacksmiths to be able to keep those horses on the road because all of those horses would require reshoeing every few days. You'd have um, massive amounts of requirement for um, you know, weaponsmiths and armorsmiths and so on to be able to keep producing and keep maintaining all of this equipment. So, but we just don't know how it was achieved, although obviously it was achieved. We know that, I'm just going to refer to some notes here, sorry. We know that there were um, eight of these birds that uh, achieved municipal status. That being Stafford, Chester, Bridge North, Tamworth, Hereford, Hartford, sorry, Warwick, Buckingham and Maldon. The largest of these birds was Winchester, Warwick and Wallingford. Wareham and Wallingford are the best preserved with their earthworks. So we know that Alfred built 33 of these burrs and we know that the burrs continued in their kind of development and expansion throughout the reign of his children and the reign of his grandchildren. In fact, it got to a point where uh, Edward the so-called unready or Edward the Ill-Advised, um, really hadn't done much in terms of military preparation because it really didn't need to. Um, so much of this pre uh, preparation had been achieved by his ancestors and, and therefore, I guess, um, his military had become neglected because um, these raids had essentially stopped and it was just a part of government which, which essentially had gotten forgotten about. Right, well, guys, so that's basically... The Anglo-Saxon Burr. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.